Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to look at what are polynomial functions and some of the characteristics so we can graph. So in this section, we're going to identify what are polynomial functions, recognize the characteristics of their graphs, determine the end behavior of a polynomial function graph, determine the real zeros of a polynomial function by factoring, and identify the multiplicities of the real zeros. So in this section, we're going to study polynomial functions of degree two or more. So we need to talk about the terminology involving polynomial functions. So in polynomial functions, you have n, which is a non-negative integer. That means it's the numbers one, two, three, four, and so on, the counting numbers. You also have a sub n, a sub n minus one, through a sub two, a sub one, and a sub zero. These are just real numbers. So they can be fractions, decimals, positive real numbers, or negative real numbers, whole numbers as well. The function defined by f of x equals a sub n, x to the n, plus a sub n minus one, x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. Now this is how a polynomial function is typically written. The largest power of x is typically the first term you write. And the next highest power of x is the next term. And the next highest power is the next term. This is called descending order of degree. So this number n is the highest power of x and that is called the degree of a polynomial function so this polynomial function has a degree n the a sub n a sub n minus one through a sub two a sub one a sub zero these are called coefficients and they are just real numbers and the subscript is written in such a way that it matches the degree of the term so a sub n minus one is the coefficient for the x to the n minus 1 term, a sub 2 is the coefficient for x squared, and so on. The dot 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 means there could be several terms that are omitted, but it's the, it is keeping the same pattern from one term to the next term to the next term for using the notation. The a sub n is called the leading coefficient because it is the coefficient for the term that has the highest degree highest power of x. So we're going to talk more about the properties about polynomial functions. The domain of a polynomial function is the set of all real numbers. So you might have noticed with this polynomial function, there are no even roots involved. So we'll never take an even root of a negative number. And all these powers of x, because n is not negative, it's, it's positive, all these powers are going to be positive powers of x. So we'll never have to worry about division by x at all. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. That's true for any polynomial function. So here's an example of a polynomial function. 3x to the fifth plus 6x to the fourth minus 2x to the third plus x to the second plus 7x subtract 6. We're going to point out the key characteristics of this polynomial function. The highest power of x is 5, so that's called the degree of the polynomial. The coefficient for the term that has the highest power of x is called the leading coefficient, so 3 is the leading coefficient, and the degree is 5. The entire term, 3x to the fifth, is called the leading term. So the entire term, 3, 6, negative 2, 1, 7, and negative 6 are the coefficients, as we talked about just a second ago. Make sure that you t keep the sign with the number, so negative 2 is the coefficient in front of x cubed. Negative 6 is called the constant term. It's the term that does not have a power of x at all. It's really x to the zero power. So that's called the constant term. Here are some examples of polynomial functions. 
A couple of them we've actually have already talked about it in previous videos. So p of x equals 4x minus 7. This is a linear function. The highest power of x is 1. So linear functions are polynomial functions. That's where the degree is 1. The leading term is 4x. And you might notice this from earlier in the class. The slope is 4. And the y-intercept is the constant term. Another type of function that we've talked about before is this p of x equals x squared plus x. The highest power of x is 2. That makes this a quadratic function. So the degree is 2. Quadratic functions are polynomial functions. If they're polynomial functions where the degree is 2. The leading term is x squared. And it looks like there is no constant term, so it's 0. The next type, next two types of polynomials we have not discussed yet. So p of x equals 2x cubed minus 6x squared plus 10. This is called a cubic function, or a cubic polynomial. It's where the highest power of x is 3. So degree 3 are called cubic polynomials. The leading term is 2x cubed, and the constant term is 10. And the last one, p of x equals negative 5x to the fourth plus x minus 2. The degree is 4, so this is called a quartic polynomial. The leading term is negative 5x to the fourth. That's the term that has the highest power of x. And negative 2 is the constant term. So this gives you an idea that we have seen polynomial functions before. It's just we didn't call linear functions polynomial functions or quadratic functions polynomial functions. But Linear and quadratic are degree 1 and, respectively, degree 2 polynomials. So now that we know what polynomial functions, how they look when we write them, let's talk about what do the graphs look like. Polynomial functions where the degree is 2 or higher need to be smooth. The graphs need to be smooth and continuous. So what that means is that a smooth graph, a graph that is smooth, contains only rounded curves, no sharp corners. So let's talk about what this means in terms of the first two graphs. These graphs have smooth transitions from increasing to decreasing and decreasing to increasing. So this first graph is smooth. It has rounded corners or rounded curves. The other, the next one, also has a smooth transition from decreasing to increasing, increasing to decreasing, and then decreasing to increasing. So this is also smooth. The graph is smooth. Whereas the next, or whereas this last graph, notice that this is not a smooth transition. So this is called a sharp corner, or some people just call it a corner. And also a corner occurs here and here. So those are all corners. So this is not a smooth graph. So this last graph cannot be a polynomial function because it's not a smooth graph. So in addition to being a graph being smooth, a polynomial function needs to be continuous. That means the graph has no breaks and can be drawn without lifting your pencil or pen. So these first two are both continuous. You can draw the graph without lifting your pencil or pen. Same thing for the second graph, also continuous. So these first two graphs are examples of polynomial functions. The third graph, though, this function is not continuous. The graph can be drawn for this first part of the graph, but then I'm going to have to lift my pencil or pen because there's a jump or a break in the graph. So this is not continuous. And since it's not continuous or Sometimes people just write discontinuous. 
this third graph is not a polynomial function graph because it's not continuous. Polynomial functions need to be smooth and continuous graphs. All right, so that identifies what polynomial function graphs will look like. Now we're going to start building up the tools that we need to actually graph polynomial functions ourselves. So this is called the end behavior. We talked a lot about the shape of a parabola in the previous video with when we talked about quadratic functions. Polynomial functions, determining the shape is going to be the very first step that we need when we graph. So that's what's called the end behavior. It's what's happening at the far left end of the graph and the far right end of the graph. So for example, these first two, first two graphs were polynomial functions. This graph is going down as you go to the left, but going up as you go to the right. This graph is going up to the left and all and up to the right. So it gives us very different cases of what polynomial function graphs might look like on the far ends. So we need to understand what is happening at the far left and far right ends. And this is called the end behavior. It turns out that the leading term, the term with the degree, the highest power of x, and the leading coefficient determines the shape of a polynomial function. So the leading term, and using the definition that we, we were looking at before, the leading term was a sub n x to the n. So the degree is n in this case. And the leading coefficient is a sub n. We can use what's called the leading coefficient test to determine whether the graph will be going up to the left or down to the left, up to the right or down to the right. And this is called the leading coefficient test. It says if the degree is an odd number and the leading coefficient is positive, the graph will go down to the left, up to the right. So if it's odd degree, they have opposite behavior. One's going down to the left, the other is going up to the right. If the leading coefficient is negative, it does the opposite. It's up to the left, down to the right. So it's opposite behavior if the degree is odd an odd number. If the degree is even, they have the same behavior on both ends of the graph. The graph will be going up to the left, up to the right, if the leading coefficient is positive, and down to the left, down to the right, if the leading coefficient is negative. So let's state this leading coefficient, or sometimes people call it the leading term test, more formally. So the leading term test tells you if x increases or if x decreases without bound, that means what happens at the far ends of the graph, a polynomial function will eventually rise only or fall only on the ends. So case number one, if the degree is even and the leading coefficient is positive, Remember, if the degree is even, they have the same behavior on the ends, up, up, or down, down. The leading coefficient determines which of the cases is it. The leading coefficient's positive means it's going up to the left, up to the right. So that is this graph. Case number one would be the graph is going up to the left, up to the right, or rises to the left, rises to the right. Case number two, if the degree is even and the leading coefficient is negative, then it just does the opposite. The graph falls to the left and falls to the right. So that's the second graph. The graph is falling to the left, falling to the right. So it would have even degree and negative leading coefficient. Case number three, the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is positive. So if, there, if the degree is odd, the end behavior are opposite. Leading coefficient positive means 
the graph will eventually rise to the right. It will rise as you go to the right. And since the degree is odd, it falls as you go to the left. So that's this third graph. The graph is falling to the left and rising to the right. So that has odd degree, leading coefficients positive. And the last case, n is odd, leading coefficient is negative. The graph rises to the left, falls to the right. And that's this last graph. Rises to the left, falls to the right. We're not going to be concerned about what happens in the middle part of the graph, or what's called the interior. We'll get to that after we talk about the end behavior. So let's do example one to practice the leading coefficient test. Use a leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of each of these polynomial functions. So number one, we're going to look at f of x equals negative 5x to the fourth plus x subtract 2. We're going to determine what's the end behavior using the leading coefficient test. So the leading coefficient test says I need the degree, which in this case the highest power of x is 4, and I need the leading coefficient, which looks like it's negative 5. So the degree is an even number, and the leading coefficient is less than zero. It's negative. So which of the four cases would the graph look like? Right, it's case number two. Even degree, leading coefficient's negative. So the graph will fall to the left, fall to the right. The dot, dot, dot just means that's just what's happening in the middle. We don't know that yet. So the graph will fall to the left, fall to the right. Alright, let's try another problem, another polynomial function. Let's say this function is g of x equals negative 11x to the fifth plus 6x to the sixth plus 17x to the seventh. So I mentioned this before, a polynomial typically is written in descending order, highest power of x, next highest power of x, and so on, until the lowest power of x. But this polynomial is not written in that form. So you have to be a little careful. The degree is always the highest power of x, 7. And the leading coefficient is the coefficient with the highest power of x, which is 17. Even though it's not written first, it's the term that has the highest power of x. So that's the leading term. So this time the degree is an odd number, 7, and the leading coefficient is positive, 17. So which of the four cases would the graph look like? Yep, case number 3. Odd degree, so they have opposite behavior, falling to the left, rising to the right. So these are two of the four cases for leading coefficient test. And this is the, like I said, this is the first step that we need when we are graphing a polynomial function, determining its shape. Once we know the shape of a polynomial function's graph, now we can start focusing on its interior, where the graph has hills and valleys, maximum and minimum values. So we're going to start focusing on what are called the zeros of a polynomial function. Okay, we actually have seen this before, the, the term zeros of a function. If f of x is a polynomial function, when you make the function equal to zero and solve for x, then those x values are called zeros of the polynomial, polynomial function. Sometimes they're called roots of the equation, 
or solutions to the equation, but most of the time they're called zeros of a polynomial function. And how does this help us with graphing? The zeros of this equation, this polynomial equation, correspond to x-intercepts on, on the polynomial function's graph. So example two, we're going to have a way of finding out what zeros are for a polynomial. So f of x equals negative two x squared, subtract four x plus six. This is a polynomial function of degree two. So this is a quadratic function or quadratic polynomial function. So if we want to find, determine the, all the zeros of the polynomial function, we set the function equal to zero and solve for x. So let's try factoring. We have four ways to solve a quadratic equation, which it becomes a quadratic equation now. Let's try factoring. They all have, all the terms have a negative two in common as a GCF, so we can factor out a negative two. X squared plus two X subtract three remaining equals zero. And you have a trinomial, and the co leading coefficient is 1. Now, what are two factors that multiply to negative 3, and the same two factors add to 2? It turns out it's x plus 3, and x attract 1. So it looks like negative 2 cannot be 0, but x plus 3 could is equal 0, or x minus 1 equals 0. So this gives us the zeros, x equals negative 3, or x equals 1. And those are called the zeros of the polynomial function. And these would correspond to x-intercepts. There would be an x-intercept at negative 3, comma 0, and an x-intercept at 1, comma 0. So quadratic equations, we could try factoring. Let's try a polynomial that's not a quadratic function. So f of x equals x cubed plus 2x squared, subtract 4x, subtract 8. So this is a polynomial function where the degree is 3. So this is a cubic polynomial function. So we're still trying to find out what are the zeros of the polynomial function. So take the f of x, the whole function, and set it equal to zero. There are four terms. So let's try factor by grouping. Group the first two terms and group the last two terms and make sure the negative is included with the, the 4x. Now let's factor out what is in common with each group. First group, there's an x squared, x plus 2 remaining. There's a negative 4 in the second group. Factor out, and you'll have x plus 2 remaining. And then there's an x plus 2 in common. x squared subtract 4 is what's remaining. And then you might have noticed that x squared minus 4, that's a difference of squares. So that factors even further. x plus 2, x plus 2, x minus 2 equals 0. So it looks like we're going to have three zeros for this polynomial function. Looks like x plus 2 equals 0. Or we already have x plus 2 listed, so we don't need to list it again. x minus 2 equals 0. So x equals negative 2 or x equals positive 2. So it looks like this polynomial function will have an x-intercept at negative 2 and an x-intercept at positive 2. So sometimes you can factor the polynomial function to determine the zeros. Alright, so example 3. We're going to work our way backwards. 
In example three, they're asking us to construct a polynomial function. Find a polynomial function where the degree is three and the zeros are negative three, two, and five. And the graph of the polynomial function must pass through zero comma 30. So let's think about this as we were going backwards from example two. Example two, we found the zeros from a polynomial function and now we're trying to go from zeros back to the polynomial function itself. So let's start off with the zeros. There were x equals negative 3, x equals 2, and x equals 5. Well, to be able to get x equals negative 3, that means I had to solve an equation that was set equal to 0. So that means the equation was x plus 3 equals 0 to get x equals negative 3. To get x equals 2, it needed to be x minus 2 equals 0. And x equals 5, it had to be x minus 5 equals 0. Those are the equations that we had to use to get the zeros. So now this tells us what the factors are. So to be able to set each of the factors equal to zero, the polynomial had to be in factored form equal to zero. So the factors are x plus three, x minus two, and x minus five. Those are the three factors that would give us these equations that are each equal to zero, which would give, this, give us these three zeros. So now we have the polynomial in factored form. So the polynomial would be f of x, which is called f of x. It'd be x plus 3 times x minus 2 times x subtract 5. Multiple, and it can be, you can write the factors in any order, but they're all multiplied when you have it in factored form. The only thing that we haven't discussed yet is, look at what happened in the previous example with number one. We factored out a GCF, a greatest common factor, was negative two. And that negative two never, never affected what the zeros were. We came up with x equals negative three and x equals one from the factors, but we didn't have the negative two affect those zeros. So going coming down to example three again, there could have been a number that we factored out at the very beginning of the problem, from the very beginning of the polynomial. So let's right now just call it an, an A, letter A for the variable. This is where the zero comma 30 comes in. We still need this function to pass through the point 0 comma 30, the y-intercept. If the x is 0, the y value must be 30. So f of x must be 30. We'll keep a for now and replace all the x values with a 0. This gives us a way to figure out what a is. So it's 30 equals a times 3 times negative 2 times negative 5. 30 equals 3 times negative 2 times negative 5 is 30, so 30 times a. And if you divide both sides by 30, a is 1. So in other words, we factored out a 1, or didn't factor any GCF out. So our polynomial would be x plus 3, x minus 2, times x minus 5. And that's the polynomial in factored form. So that's how you can take the zeros, find out their factors, and then find out what the factored form of the polynomial would be. And this is the degree three polynomial. If you took x times x, that's x squared. And if you take x squared times the last x, you get x to the third power. So it is degree three.
Okay, and the last thing we're going to look at in this video is what are what's called the multiplicities of zeros. So once we have a polynomial, and let's say we take this polynomial f of x equals negative x to the fourth plus 4x four cubed subtract 4x squared, I notice that I can factor out a negative. So let's take the negative out from all three terms. This is the polynomial that would be remaining. Factor out x squared because that's the highest power of x in common. That should be a 2. If you factor out x squared, what will be remaining will also factor as x minus 2 squared. So this is completely factored. So that's the first step if you want to find the zeros or the multiplicities of zeros. It needs to be completely factored. Notice that the factors are what gives you the zeros. You take the factors and you set each of them equal to zero. So we would get x equals zero and x equals two. But that's not the whole story. Notice that we are not even including the exponents at all when you find the zeros. So the multiplicity is how many times does the factor x minus r occur? x minus r occur, if it occurs, k times, but not any more than that, not k plus 1 times, then r is the 0, and it has multiplicity k. So for this, this polynomial function, we would have x equals 0, but that factor occurred two times. So the multiplicity would be 2. And the other factor would be x equals 2, or the 0 would be x equals 2, because the factor is x minus 2. And that factor occurs 2 times, but not 3 times. So its multiplicity is 2. So that's a quick example of what multiplicity or how to find multiplicities of a polynomial function and the connection between multiplicities and graphing is it tell the it tells us whether the graph will cross or touch and turn around at an x-intercept and here's the connection if r is the zero and the multiplicity is even so an even number the graph will touch the x-axis at the x-intercept and turn around. So it will stay, the graph will stay on the same side of the x-axis. It will touch the x-axis and then bounce off or turn around. If r is a zero of odd multiplicity, so multiplicity is one, three, five, and so on, the graph will cross the x-axis at the x-intercept. And the larger the multiplicity is, the graph tends to flatten out near the x-intercepts. So let's try the last example. Example 4. The polynomial function is 5 times x minus 2 times x plus 3 all to the second times x minus a half all to the fourth. Let's start off by determining the zeros. So to find the zeros, you take the function and you set it equal to zero. Make sure the polynomial is factored. This one has already been factored for us completely. So set equal to zero. That means each of these factors could be zero. X equals, or x minus two equals zero, or x plus three equals zero, or x minus a half equals zero. And if you solve each of these equations, x equals two, or x equals negative three, or x equals positive a half. So those are the zeros of the polynomial function. So we were doing that, those types of problems in example uh, two. So now the problem says state, oh, also needs to determine the multiplicities of the zeros, and then state whether the graph crosses the x-axis 
or touches the x-axis and turns around at each zero. So let's talk about x equals 2. x equals 2, that factor was x minus 2, and it occurred one time. So the multiplicity is 1. Which is an odd number. That means the graph crosses x-axis at x equals 2. Because the multiplicity, multiplicity is an odd number, the graph crosses the x-axis at the 0. Okay, the next 0, x equals 3. The multiplicity is how many times does the factor appear? x equals 3, the factor, or is negative 3, the factor for x equals negative 3 was x plus 3, and it occurred two times. So the multiplicity is even. So the graph uh, touches the x-axis and turns around at x equals negative 3. So if the multiplicity is even, the graph will touch the x-axis and bounce off or turn around. And the la last zero was x equals a half. The multiplicity is 4, which is also an even number. So the graph will do the same. The graph will touch the x-axis and turn around. So it will stay on the same side of the x of the x axis. So that's how the connection that's how you determine the zeros and that's how you determine the multiplicities of the zeros and the connection between multiplicities of the zeros and graphing for polynomial functions. So now we have an idea of what polynomial functions in behavior are and also what happens towards x intercepts. So does the graph cross or does the graph touch and turn around? So in the next video, we're going to look at how to graph polynomial functions. If you have any questions about any of the examples that we've, that we've talked about in this video, please let me know. Or any problems in the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video.